right. One more word and we to do it. So, one of the things I said is that sequence calls are rated in commercial frames of reference. So, the special thing I said about, about commercial frames of reference is that these are frames that are either moving at fixed velocity uh, or they are not moving. So, and then we show what does not move in mean. And then we, uh, then we touched upon the fact that not moving is basically not possible because no matter where you are in the universe, you'll be moving south. So, So, so the idea was that to, to, to go a little bit deeper uh, in that uh, before, we, before we leave the concept. So we learned a few important things to, uh, from which we can quickly build upon right now. One of the things we learned upon, learned of, was the issue of going uh, of uniform uh, circular motion. And the idea of uniform circular motion is that whatever is going around is going around at a fixed speed. I'll call V speed. And because this number is fixed, so, the, the, so V, which is the speed, is constant. So that's what we mean when we talk about uniform circular motion. All right? So, and we also discussed that velocity, which has a magnitude and a direction, as you are going around in a circle, the velocity is continuously changing. And we already know that if velocity is changing, there must be an acceleration. So that led us to a few things. First is we discuss the time period t. The time period t is, is the time for one full uh, circle, to make one full circle. So if you, take, if you take a rigid body, let's say you take your wheel, of your car, and let us assume that the wheel is rigid, which it is not. The wheel is actually quite soft, but let's assume it's rigid. If it is, then it turns out, of course, that if you take any point in the wheel, and the wheel is turning, uh, that point will make a full circle. The time taken for the full circle is what we call the period. So this was an important notation. I. Uh, I introduced, and I also said there is something called the frequency, and the frequency is 1 over t, and there is something called the angular frequency, which is 2 pi over t. So, in other words, you cover an angle of 2 pi. The 2 pi means a full circle over t. So the frequency and the angular frequency, they are used in different contexts, and, and so we use both of them. And the other thing that we talked about is that V, uh, which is distance over time, uh, let's say this thing has radius r. So then for a point here to go around in a full circle, the distance traveled would be uh, 2 pi r. And then 2 pi r divided by t would be the speed, because 2 pi r is the distance traveled by the circle over a period of time t, because 2 pi r of 2 pi r over t, and then this 2 pi over t piece is nothing but omega. So we had v equals omega r. So this was a very important formula for us that led us to think about stuff like, what are you doing? You. Are you playing with your phone? Can you please get rid of it before I kick you out? Um, so V is equal to R omega. So if R goes to 0, then V would be 0. So, so in the middle of this circular thing, uh, circular motion, if you go right in the middle, then there is no, then there is no uh, speed. Here, omega, of course, is being regarded as a constant. And for now, when we talk about uniform circular motion, we'll talk about omega being constant. Later on, when we get into rotational 
dynamics, we will relax that condition just like we relax the condition of acceleration being constant versus acceleration not being constant, which is what we are getting into now. So V is R omega. The other thing I talked about is the issue of centripetal acceleration A sub C. Okay? So centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. I didn't give you a full derivation of this, but centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. By the way, today is not the first day you were playing with your phone. I've seen you playing with your phone on Tuesday as well. I just didn't bother to stop. And you are lucky I didn't kick you out. But I will start it from now because I'm, I'm getting tired of giving warnings. I catch you with a phone, you are screwed for the day. So AC is V square over R. So V is omega square R square over R. And this is omega square so times R. So you have to be very careful when you calculate the centripetal acceleration. Because when you write the centripetal acceleration like this, you bear in mind that you have the R downstairs. So it is very easy to get to the erroneous conclusion that if R goes to zero, the centripetal acceleration becomes infinite. But that's not true. Because you see, there is an R sitting here as well. So the right way of extracting the dependence of centripetal acceleration on R should be by using this form rather than that form. Because omega doesn't have any dependence on R. Omega is exactly the same at any point on this object which is rotating. Because remember, omega is 2 pi over t. And every point in that object is going to trace out 2 pi in time t. So this is very subtle. And I'll, I'll almost guarantee you that if I put this question in a quiz, most of you will get it wrong, which means it will be put on a quiz. Okay, so, so just, just know this and don't screw this up. If you do, maybe I, I'll take extra points off just because you're, you're not paying attention. So the fact is that centripetal acceleration, V square over R, is omega square R square over R. So if you want to write it fully to figure out what is the R dependence, that is the right way in which you look at it. Because otherwise, V has an R dependence. So by setting this equal to 0 and not doing the change here doesn't make any sense. You are inventing trouble. OK, so, so let us calculate, for example, exactly what is the centripetal acceleration that we experience while we are on the surface of the Earth. That's something is recalculate. And let us see what influence it might have on us. So for example, let's say this is the Earth. Now the Earth is not really uh, a sphere. The Earth is a squashed sphere. Uh, it's a flattened sphere. It's called an oblate spheroid. So the poles actually, uh, the pole to pole distance is shorter than end to end distance on two opposite sides of the Earth along the equator. But let's say for now, we drop that complication. We just assume that Earth is a very nice sphere. The Earth is rotating about some axis. The axis actually has a tilt of 23 some degrees. But we'll not worry about that. We'll just assume that for now it's a vertical axis. And we can always draw our axis in such a way that it aligns with the actual Earth's axis. And that won't introduce any error. Earth is rotating, let's say, uh, it's rotating at an angular speed of omega, which means it's turning 2 pi over time t. So omega then, as I said by definition, uh, as long as we consider it to be a sphere, should be 2 pi over time t. What is the period of rotation of the Earth? Come on. Period of rotation of the Earth. 24 hours. You were not sure? What's the matter with you? Not getting enough coffee in the morning. So 24 hours, so you've got to multiply uh, this 24 hours and make it into seconds because normally that's what we would do. So it's 24 hours times 3,600 seconds per hour, right? Uh, so that's, that's what you have. And then you already know that the centripetal acceleration A sub C is going to be omega square R. So you know this omega. 
and you've got to know Earth radius. So this is where, of course, the Earth being an oblate spheroid, or Earth being not an oblate spheroid, all that comes in. So in this case, we just assume Earth to be a sphere. Uh, the radius of the Earth is 6400, actually it's 6390 or so kilometers. So we'll just take it for now, roughly 6400 kilometers. That's just the radius, so across the Earth is 12,800 uh, kilometers if you go through the middle. So if you do the numbers, uh, this number is not the big problem, but this number is large enough that you, if you put it in meters, that you end up with a number which is uh, 0 0.034 uh, meters per second square. So this is a very small number, right? So, and that's the reason why uh, a rest frame, so if, I, if I'm standing and there is a frame attached to me, let's call that a rest frame, I'm not moving, my V is zero, uh, can be regarded approximately as a as an inertial frame of reference because this acceleration is very, very tiny. The acceleration is so tiny, in fact, that our bodies uh, will, not, uh, will not feel it. Our bodies are not designed to feel it. In fact, if we did, you would be extremely uncomfortable, probably go nuts in no time. So our bodies are designed not to be sensitive to such uh, small accelerations. So assuming that the, that the acceleration due to gravity is about 10 meters per second squared, this is about you know, roughly 300 times uh, less than that. It's, it's one upon 300 of, of roughly uh, the acceleration, like the acceleration of gravity that you would feel. So this is primarily the reason why, uh, sitting on Earth, we can, we can perceive of an inertial frame of reference, okay? Now it turns out that in most, uh, most objects, in most planets and most satellites, uh, this more or less works because since the objects are going around at, at some finite time, uh, 24 hours, by the way, is not a terribly, terribly uh, long time for rotation. Some are much, much longer. Some are somewhat shorter. So unless you get to neutron stars and stuff, this, this number, uh, even if you reduce it by a factor of 20, it's still a, a number that's not going to contribute to making omega very large. So what contributes to making uh, the centripetal acceleration large is the R. So unless you get to extremely large objects, uh, you probably uh, would still be able to assume a more or less inertial frame of reference on the surface of the object. Now you can't go to Jupiter because Jupiter is a gas primarily. But if you go to Jupiter, uh, R is significantly larger and you might actually feel some of these uh, effects uh, coming in. So you may have trouble uh, really getting, getting a very good inertial frame of reference. So anyway, I, I just wanted to give you some, some numbers so you have an idea about what the inertial frame of reference really implies. So we don't really have a true inertial frame, but we can get pretty close to it. Let's go to Newton's second law. So Newton's second law is operationally the most important law that we'll use. So the idea of Newton's second law, it's an empirical law, uh, empirical law meaning that it's a law based upon what we observe and making sure that what we observe uh, is indeed seen in nature by repeated experimentation. So that's how you arrive at natural laws. Natural laws cannot typically be derived from something even more fundamental because that is the mo most fundamental thing that we know. So let us take a spring uh, and let's say you stretch the spring uh, to some point here, and we all know what happens. Uh, if you stretch the spring, the spr spring would want to go back to its original equilibrium position. Likewise, if I squeeze this spring, the exact same thing will happen. If I squeeze it, I'll be actually uh, pushing it that way, and the spring would want to go back uh, this way. Now, when I talk about springs, until I actually tell you that is not the case, we will always be thinking about springs that are extremely light, okay? So we won't be considering quote unquote palpably heavy springs. So in an approximate sense, we would think about 
what we would call massless springs. So this is an abstraction. When we say massless, can something be really massless? The answer is no. Nothing can be really massless. But for operational purposes to make our life simple, if we are considering very, very light springs, then we can think of it for our purposes as massless because it enormously simplifies calculation and studies. So all springs that I'll talk about, unless I tell you otherwise, are massless springs. I may not remind you uh, about this. So now let us say we actually put a mass at the end of the spring because the spring is massless. So we put a mass here. And let's call this mass M1. And we stretch it with some force. And it goes back. And as it goes back, there is a force involved. And there will be an acceleration, let's say, A1. And again, we do the same thing. But now we put some other mass, let's say M2. Again, we stretch it. Uh, the stretches may be slightly different, uh, a bit, but the same force is involved. So here I apply the force F. Here also I apply the force F. This also would like to go back to its, to its equilibrium position, but now that the mass is different, what you'll observe is that it'll go back with some other acceleration, A2. So the accelerations would then depend upon the mass. So empirically, essentially by looking at uh, data and observations and by making a guess, the idea then emerged that F is M1 A1, in this case, equals to M2 A2. And this, of course, is the guts of Newton's second law. That's exactly the statement of Newton's second law, that force is mass times acceleration. And by mass, what we literally mean is the number of atoms that make, make the thing up. Okay. So, so F equal to MA, uh, therefore, is, is force. M, of course, is the mass. We know how mass is written in kilograms. So if I do a dimensional analysis, uh, we are talking mass here. Acceleration, we know very well, is length over time square. Or let me put the square outside. So therefore, the dimension of force would exactly be uh, mass times length over t squared. So that would then mean that the force in SI units would be written in kilogram uh, meter per second squared. So that would be the unit of force in SI units. Now, this particular unit has a name in honor of Isaac Newton. This unit is called a Newton. A Newton is a fairly sizable unit. So for example, if you are pressing a doorbell, nowadays there are not too many doorbells around. Uh, but if you press a doorbell, you're probably using up a force of about half a Newton. So depending on how hard you press it, I have noticed that when the FedEx guy comes to my door, he probably uses about 30 Newtons, but the doorbell just works fine in about half a Newton. So Newton is a fairly large unit of force. Now, force is a vector. Force has a magnitude and direction. That should not be a surprise because I can write this in vectorial form. I know mass is just a quantity. So mass has no directionality. So mass is a scalar. Acceleration I know very well is a vector, and so therefore, force must be a vector. One of the quantities that we have dealt with a lot already is, is the force due to gravity. So that that's an example of forces that we have been dealing with ever since we, we were born. In fact, before we were born. And that force due to gravity is basically mass times uh, acceleration due to gravity. So that's a force that we experience all the time. Now, there is no law in the universe that's valid without any bounds. I wish there were, but we haven't found stuff that, that are quite so profound. We have come pretty close, I think, as, as scientists, but, but we don't know things that well. So how far does this work? Well, uh, Newton's second law turns out to be a very, very powerful law. It's, it's valid in uh, extremely small domains and also in extremely large scales. So just to give you an example, 
Uh, if you are considering, for example, the surface of this table, and if I tell you that the surface of this table is made out of so-and-so uh, molecules, bring them, break them down into atoms, and I say these atoms interact with each other in a certain way, uh, that we know, let's say, somehow. And then I say, okay, fine, I can actually model a tiny piece of this table. I can take maybe, uh, I don't know, micron by micron, which is 10 to the minus 6 meters by 10 to the minus 6 meters, super tiny area of this table. And I go down to the atomic scale, and I actually model this, which I can on the computer. Now, it will take a very powerful computer. It will take a lot of number crunching. But I'll actually be able to pretty much know everything that needs to be known about this table, just, just as an example. Now, what am I really doing on the computer? What am I telling the computer to do? Well, what I'm telling the computer to do is to actually solve Newton's equations for each of these atoms. I give them the forces, and I tell them that work out the Newton's equations when these atoms are interacting with each other. Depending upon how far they are, the forces may vary. But take all of that into account, into account take the structure of, of the material, do the calculation, and tell me what you come up with. And that's what the numbers will give me. And those numbers will be good enough for me to model this table with an incredible amount of accuracy. So as you can see, what I'm trying to tell you is that Newton's second law is really, really valid at the atomic scale. Quantum mechanics in this case is not needed. So quantum mechanics comes in in many cases, but not in this case. It, it also doesn't necessarily, as we have learned over time, have much to do with how small or how big it is. Quantum mechanics may be very valid at very large scales, but, but also at very small scales. It depends upon the physical situation. But Newton's, Newton's laws hold up very well, even, at, even in atomic scales. That's the point I want to make. Second point I want to make is that now let's go large. Let's go to the level of galaxies, and even larger. And let's imagine that we are using Newton's laws, and all we are putting in is that uh, the masses, they interact with each other with gravity, which also Newton gave us, and which we will come to later. So you put in the gravitational forces. Otherwise, you use, you use Newton's laws. And it turns out even then, in many, many situations, you actually get reasonably good results. What gets in the way, though, is that when you get to stuff like galaxies and so on, things are moving fast. So when things are moving fast, uh, depending upon how fast it is, Newton's, Newton's second law begins to weaken. So where does it fall apart? It falls apart when, some, when, when the velocities uh, become closer and closer to the velocity of light, which is the, which is the highest speed that matter can attain. And that is about 186,000 miles per second. Right. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. So Newton's laws essentially become uh, not valid then when you get to speeds that are close to velocity of light. Maybe let's say a tenth of the velocity of light, uh, a fiftieth of the velocity of light, a hundredth of the velocity of light. Newton's second law will actually begin to give you some erroneous results. So as you can see, it's an extremely important law. And knowing Newton's second law alone um, gets you very, very far uh, in, in understanding nature around us. Now I'll, any, any questions so far? I'm mostly doing concepts. I'm going to switch gears very soon into some pretty intensive problems. So, but I got to start at the base first. So now we'll go to uh, what, what one would call Newton's third law. Newton's third law is a, is a very, uh, it's a complicated law, okay? Uh, we'll try to keep life simple, but Newton's third law is a complicated law. So let us, let us then put the proviso that this is valid, uh, Newton's second law is valid for uh, velocities much, much less than c, where c is the velocity of light, and c is approximately uh, 186,000 miles per second, 300,000, roughly 300,000 kilometers uh, per second, I think. Etc. So, as long as this condition is satisfied, this is valid. Newton's third law. So, Newton's third law is a, is a fascinating law because it tells us 
about the concept of action and reaction. Now, action and reaction is a very tricky thing. For example, I hold this chalk. Okay? If I hold this chalk in my hand, Newton's, Newton's third law is very much at play. Because if I didn't hold this chalk, the chalk would fall. So mg would be pulling it down. But I am holding this chalk and the chalk is not falling, which means what? Which means that the chalk is trying to fall and in doing so, it's exerting a force on my hand and if I remove that force, it will happily fall. But my hand is giving the chalk an equal and opposite force such that the chalk doesn't fall. So I am giving my force to the chalk and that's upward. The chalk is giving its force to my hand that's downward. The two things are not acting on the same object. My hand is applying the force on the chalk. The chalk is applying the force on my hand. All right. So this is the first very important thing that often trips people up. So let's say this is my hand uh, and, and this is the chalk here. And this chalk then applies uh, a force uh, down below, which is, which is going to be mg, right? And, and this would be a force due to gravity. And I am counteracting this force. So that's coming from me on the opposite direction. And this is my force. And let's call this F hand. And that's also a vector. So these two forces are acting on different objects. Keep that in mind. That's very important. Uh, this is where people get tripped up because people often think that the two forces are acting on the same object. No, they're acting on different objects. I'm standing on the ground. Had the ground not been there, I would have fallen, right? I would have gone downward. So mg that I'm doing is, is applying down on the floor. But the floor is applying an equal and opposite force back to me such that I'm not falling. That's the concept. So the force that the floor is giving me plus my weight should be zero because those two are equal and opposite. So the idea here would be that F hand plus F gravity. Of course, the signs would be different because they're in opposite direction. This is here. So let's think about you sitting on a chair. Uh, here you are. Here is your chair. Uh, and here you are uh, sitting on the chair trying to study some physics, whatever. Uh, well, you're not really sitting, so let's put something here. OK, so now what happens is that you are applying a force downward on the chair, but you're not falling, luckily, because the chair itself is giving you a support, which is equal now. Same, same idea. So let's now do a simple problem and see how Newton's second law and Newton's third law uh, plays out in something which is a little bit more complicated. So one thing we can think about is we have two blocks. Uh, we have a block, a big one, and then here is a small block. And the small block is being held in place uh, basically because I am pushing into the block here. And this thing is, of course, on a surface. And for now, we'll assume the surface is ice. It's frictionless. Okay? For all practical purposes, the surface we'll assume is frictionless. So let's call this mass 1. And let's call this mass 2. And let's say I want to apply a force. And this force, the magnitude of this force, let's say, for the sake of numbers, is 20 newtons. Because newton is the unit of force. Now, I want to figure out what the masses are. And let's say, let's make up some masses. Let's say m2 has a mass uh, of, of 15 kilograms. And let's say m1 has a mass. Uh, of 5 kilograms. Okay. So by Newton's second law, if I'm applying this force on these two masses, what I have is as follows. I have the force here. I have these two masses here. 
And so by Newton's second law, if it's a frictionless surface, the whole thing should be? Should be what? Hmm? What do you mean? The whole thing should be doing what? Think about Newton's second law. You are pushing it. So the, what should it what should it do? Hmm? Why are you being so shy? Come on. What what do you think it should do? You, come on. This is stupid. You don't know? What? That we know. Be more precise. Yes. Thank you. It will be accelerating. Of course it will be moving. It will be accelerating. It could have been moving had there been friction at fixed velocity, right? But we, we are not describing that scenario. We are describing a scenario where the force will make it accelerate. So, force okay. so this will be accelerating. So therefore it's easy to calculate what the acceleration would be because I already know that F is ma. So in this case I can say F, the total mass is m1 plus m2 times acceleration and let's do it without um, vector symbols because everything is moving along a line so we can just deal with signs. So then acceleration would be F over m1 plus m2. So I've made the numbers simple enough, 20 newtons over 5.0 kilogram plus 15.0, 15 kilogram. So that will be 20 over 20. So that will be one meter per second square. That will be the acceleration of this whole system. Now, I am pushing onto one, right? But one is pushing onto two. So here you go. Here you have trouble. I am pushing onto one. One is pushing onto two. So you have Newton's third law at play. Now, two is not going to sit quiet. If two is being pushed by one, two is going to push one back. That's what Newton's third law says. So let's figure that part out. So let us, let us look at two. We pay close attention to the diagrams I am drawing. There is a name for these diagrams. And you would be losing a lot of points if you, may, if you screw up this diagram. These are called free body diagrams or force diagrams. So this is 2, and what 2 experiences is a force from the left, because 2 only sees 1 right next to it. So 2 experiences a force from the left, because 2 only sees 1 right next to it. So this is a force that's acting on 2 due to 1. That's the notation we'll use. So if I write F12, force by 1 on 2. That's what it means. Okay? So F12 means by 1, not by 1 get 2, but by 1 on 2. That's what this is. Okay? Force by 1 on 2. So now I know a few things. I know that 2 is moving at an acceleration a of 1 meter per second square. There is no, no argument about it. We know that the whole thing is moving, and we know for a fact that 2 is moving at 1 meter per second square. So you can write 1.0. I'm just being sloppy here. So I already know this is a mass which is 15 kilogram. So therefore, F12 has to be M2 times a, which means it has to be 15 kilogram times one meter per second square, which means it has to be 15 newtons. So out of the 20 newtons that I'm actually giving to push the system, 15 newtons has to be taken up by two. If we are trying to be consistent with Newton's second law, which we must be. Now we've got to figure out how does 2 obey Newton's third law and get the job done? Because 2 must apply an equal and opposite force onto 1, because that's what Newton's third law says. But 1 is much lighter. 1 has a mass of 5 kilograms. So let us now see what, what's going on. So 
let's look into, let's do the free body diagram, if you will, for one. So one we already know gets a force from the left, and this is the force of 20 newtons I have given to one. We already know that. Presumably, because one is pushing on a two, and two wants to take revenge, two is going to push back. Newton's third law. So this is the force, this part is the force that is on one due to two. It will be F21 on one due or four by, by two on one, right? This one is by two on one, all right? So now you see how it works out. We can say the net force that's acting on one is F, let's call it a vector now, just for convenience, I'm just putting in a step, and then there is F uh, by 2 on 1, and we already know what happens at the end of the day, it has to be Newton's second law M1A, we already know that M1 is 5 kilograms, and this is moving at 1 meters per second square, so this got, this got to be 5 newtons. So you see, F1 plus F plus F21 has got to be 5 newtons, because that's the force that M1 is using. Now, I already know that if I want to put in numbers and if I want to put in signs, because these are vectors, I already know the force from left to right is 20 newtons. I already know that. I don't know what this guy is. I know this is 5 newtons. So therefore, this guy has got to be minus 15 newtons. Otherwise, the math doesn't work. How would Newton's third law go with it? Newton's third law says that the forces occur in pairs. Action and reaction are equal and opposite, right? Yeah. Uh, since one is using, uh, 15 grams, it's going to exert 15 on one going back because you, uh, it, that That's right. That's right. So it is indeed Newton's third law working out, right? Because this one's getting 15 newtons. This one is giving 15 newtons on the other side, but one is already experiencing 20 newtons from the opposite direction. So one takes on only five newtons, but one is indeed getting back uh, 15 newtons from two. So Newton's third law does indeed work. So I'll give you more complex versions of this problem. This is a stripped down version of a problem that I've given. You can make your own problems, okay? So one of the things I, I encourage students to do, and I really push them hard once they start to screw up in the exams, is, and it, it happens to every one of us, when we look at a problem and the problem just works out, we tend to become complacent about it. So it's a great, so it's a great uh, uh, issue for us because when something is worked out in front of us, it looks too easy and it looks like we get it because we follow the individual steps, but that doesn't mean we get it. So one way, all of you, whether you have had physics ever, can fix that problem is give yourself a problem. Make a problem up yourself. And you will see how difficult it is. There's a reason why problems are not, auth not authored all the time. Because it takes a great deal of time. Setting up a problem is far, 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 far more difficult than actually doing it. But on the other hand, it gets you into the nitty gritty of it, into how it works and how it would fail. And that's, how, that's what you learn from it. So by all means, when I tell you guys go through the example problems in the book, the layer that I want you to add now, now that we are a month in, you're facing an exam, is you start making problems yourself and see if you can make one. And that can be anything. That can be something that is built upon something you just saw in an example, and you can try to make a simple problem based upon something that you see around yourself, which is what I do most of the time. When I, when I assign you problems, I make up problems from daily experiences. And, and you know, it turns out that it's, it's not easy to do them, but when you do them, uh, you certainly get a far better understanding of, of the material. So I can do some more numbers, but let me save some time. At this point, I can tell you that if I, if I actually drop this shock on the floor, then I can take its mass, I can take uh, the acceleration to gravity, g, and I can figure out what force is acting on it. I can also figure out 
you know, what, what uh, height it's falling from, as to what its final velocity would be, what its acceleration, uh, sorry, what, what, uh, how much time it will take and so on and so forth doing kinematics. You have already done that. So this, so it's at certain height, so that height will be, let's say, minus y, if I take this to be uh, my uh, zero level of the height. Uh, acceleration downward is g, so it's going to be minus y equals minus half gt squared because I'm dropping it. So if you know y, you can find out how long it takes and so on. Now, Newton's third law tells us literally that when you have something falling towards you, the earth should move towards that object or at least should feel a force. But the earth is not bouncing because that would make things very problematic. Now it turns out that actually does happen as far as we can tell, but it is too fine to measure. So if you do the numbers, actually in my lecture notes you'll find the numbers. If you do the numbers, you get something like, you know, 1 upon 10 to the 14 of the size of an atom. That's the kind of motion the Earth would suffer. So it's very, very tiny because the Earth is extremely massive. But the point is the Earth is very massive. So the acceleration that the Earth needs to come up with is very tiny. And those accelerations would be never felt uh, in, in nature. Now that said, you may or may not have heard that something called gravitational waves were uh, discovered. Uh, well, gravitation waves, gravitation, gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein a long time ago. But they were never really seen because it will be very, very subtle to see. Uh, in other words, measuring gravitational waves would require a level of precision that we can't attain easily on Earth, can't attain with the best of, with the best of everything we have, including our brains. But it turns out that up to a point, uh, the existence of gravitational waves can indeed be inferred. And that particular point was reached about two, three years ago. So it took about, what, more than 100 years or so, uh, or thereabouts to make that, to, make, to get there. So fine scale measurements can indeed be checked. Fine scale phenomena can indeed be checked up to a point, uh, whether we can check if Newton's third law is valid with Earth, I don't know. I don't think we can. Certainly not in our lifetimes, mine or yours. All right. Some more of these free body diagrams, because that's going, to, that's going to be a big thing for us. So let's take a block. Let's take a block, a simple block, um, sitting on a table. OK. And I want to ask you to do a free body diagram for this block. And this is something that is critically important. Why? It's critically important because if you don't uh, do the free, the free body diagram correctly, the next step is setting up equations of motion for Newton's second law based upon your free body diagram. So if your free body diagram is wrong, that means your equations will be wrong, which means your whole problem will be wrong. So this step is an extremely important elementary step for everything that we're going to do in this course from this point on. So in this case, we know it has a mass. Let's say mass is m. Okay. So then that would mean it has a weight. Which direction does the weight act for us? Up, down, sideways? Down. Weight is always down. You don't go flying up because g is upward. So no matter how things are, the weight will always be vertically down. Vertically down. Not any down, but vertically down. Now by Newton's third law, this surface is going to give a reaction force here. And let's call it F surface. And because this, this mass is neither going up nor going down, or even if it's going up or going down, it's not accelerating up or down, more importantly. Uh, you would expect that mg and fs should be the same for it to be in equilibrium. Now let us say I attach a rope here, and I pull it. And let's call this force f. So you can see, if you think in terms of axes, 
these are the forces along the y-axis and that's the force along the x-axis. I have applied a force F on the right. Now I'm saying that this surface has a roughness. This surface is not frictionless. So if you could really see the surface in, in, in big time detail, which you can nowadays, there are plenty of microscopes for which Nobel Prizes have been won by which you can see a surface with atomic scale pre precision, what you will see that all these atoms would be very unhappy because you'll be going over them. And that will generate a macroscopic force called frictional force, which is going to oppose your motion. Frictional force never helps your motion. If you end up with frictional force that helps your motion, let me know. That never happens. It'll be in the opposite direction. And we will call this a friction. These are all vectors, of course. So happily, I can put in vector signs. And that would be a free body diagram for any object in rest on a surface as long as you pull it. If you don't pull it, you just get the vertical ones. The moment you start pulling it or pushing it, you get this. Now, if you reverse the direction of the force, it will tend to go that way. So friction would be flipped as well, because friction will oppose the motion. All right? When did you come in? When did you come in? Right now? You don't get a quiz today, okay? You don't get a quiz today. After 10 minutes, you don't get a quiz. All right, so let's move on. So now we have a situation where let's get a little bit more complicated. Uh, how complicated? Well, let's have mg here. And we obviously have uh, some kind of a force here, the surface force Fs. All right, but now instead of instead of pushing it to the side, let's say uh, I give it a pull in this direction, just like you would pull a suitcase, for example. A suitcase has wheels; it's a little bit more complex, but this one doesn't have wheels. So let's say this force is some force P. Now what happens is I can break this P. Whenever I have forces at an angle, I should be sure to break them into horizontal and vertical pieces. So if this angle is theta, let's say, this would be P cosine of theta uh, here, and this would be P sine of theta. OK? P cosine of theta and P sine of theta. Why don't you wake her up? Wake up. You have slept long enough. Uh, P cos theta and P sine theta. OK? So now what happens is there will be a friction force this way. And again, this would be a friction. All right? So we can even go a step further, and I think we should. So in this case, I can set up some equations, and I can say for the x component, I can say that f, uh, or I can, I can just write it in scalar form, because it's along the x, x axis. F is positive minus F friction. And if it's moving, actually, I can write it as a net force, mass times acceleration. So these are the forces that are acting, and this is the net force. That's how Newton's equations are set up. So this is a major step I have taken right now by writing this down. Because this is what you'll be doing for a long time from now on. Everything will be built on this premise. So likely for y then, since there is no net acceleration, I should be able to write fs, which is going upward, minus mg. And there is no net force. So that should be 0. So these would be the two equations that I would get out of the first picture there. Out of the second picture, I would get for the x, p cosine of theta minus f friction should be ma, assuming this mass to be m. And for the y, I should be getting upward p sine of theta, which is upward. Another upward force, now notice, is fs and minus mg is equal to 0. All 
All right. So this is how you set up free body diagrams. Now I will do a very important free body diagram that oftentimes I find students take a, take a bit of time to get right. And this is on an incline plane. On an inclined plane, this is like an inclined plane. Now let's say it's like a block, like a right triangle basically, all right? And suppose now I put a mass here. Which way would the weight be? Vertically down, right? When you go up a mountain, vertically down. So mg, all right? Do not screw these things up. Which way would the surface force be? Surface is like this. So the important thing to keep in mind is surface always gives a force that is perpendicular to the surface. So therefore, Fs would be that way. Surface force is now changed. Suppose I decide to give it a force this way now, F. If there is friction, that friction would be opposing it. So this would be then F friction. However, this very same guy, if I, if I leave with a force in this direction, friction would be opposing again, but now it will be upward, right? So you've got to be very careful because friction is always an opposing force. So there are two kinds of problems that we would do. We would do less of problems that are equilibrium problems. So what's an equilibrium problem? An equilibrium problem is when you have the sum of all the forces along x. That's how I denote that. That's like that equation there or that equation there. But, equi but th those are not in equilibrium necessarily. Some of them are, but not all. An equilibrium problem, sum of, sum of all these forces. This is a vector sum, by the way. If you take the sides into account, uh, the sum is 0. And likewise for y, fy would be 0. That is an equilibrium problem. That means the sum of the forces vanishes. But typically, if there is no equilibrium, so I would not call it non-equilibrium, I'd call it general case. General case would be sum over fx in general would be mass times acceleration net. Okay. Or you can write another way, but it's basically the net force. I would call it AX also. Uh, instead of writing net, maybe that's a little confusing. Let's write net. And Y, this is the net force on the right side. So one of the, one of the things that students have trouble with is what is the net force? So let me just emphasize how, how you arrive at the net force, because it's not trivial. So the net force essentially has to do with what ultimately happens in plain English. So in other, yes. Oh, Bradley, you are yawning or you are trying to? Uh, oh, okay. All right. So, so if you look at the, if you look at the problem uh, up here, both in this case, which is that problem along the x direction, and in that case, which is along the x direction, this problem, the net force is here. This is the net force along that direction. This is the net force that I already wrote. Why? Because ultimately, with all the forces acting, what is happening to the mass? Where is the mass accelerating? What is the direction of the acceleration? That's what the net force is. So you have to be very careful to keep your concept clear as to how to arrive at what is the net force. Now let me illustrate 
a problem which is on equilibrium, but it's slightly more detailed. So in this problem, suppose you have a ceiling and you have taken two strings, it's not exactly symmetric, it's designed not to be symmetric, and use them to hung a mass. There is no net acceleration in this problem because this mass is static or it could be moving at fixed velocity but there is no net acceleration either way. So let's say we deal with angles here so this is 45 degrees here and let's say this is 60 degrees here. Whenever you see a string in physics strings are very tricky things okay they are not like the regular strings that we deal with uh, on in day to day lives. The strings that we deal with in day to day lives, they have mass. Okay? Just like we dealt with massless springs, we will consider massless strings. What it means is that the strings are so light compared to the masses they carry that we can ignore the mass of the string. Now you can ask me, and that would be a very good question as to why should we ignore the mass of the spring. We know the spring has a mass. The reason why we would ignore the mass of the spring is because if we keep the mass of the spring, the uh, mass of the string, the string actually quote unquote eats up the force that it transmits. And I later on, especially next Tuesday, take you to the argument as to why the string eats it up. By eats it up, I mean if you are applying a force at one end of the string, the other end of the string wouldn't be, wouldn't be kept ending up with the same force if you are using this, this spring to transmit it. Uh, sorry, the string to transmit it, if the string has a mass. But if it's massless, then it would transmit forces nicely. So in this case, there will be an mg. That doesn't take Einstein to figure it out. If it's an equilibrium, that means this mass will feel an upward tug, otherwise it would fall. So this particular area, I have drawn a free body diagram. One problem typically will have multiple free body diagrams. This free body diagram is for that area. Now we can focus on another area. What's going on here? How would you know that? Well, place yourself there and try to feel it. Suppose you are a point in this string here. What would you feel? Well, you will feel that this guy is pulling you down. So you will feel a tug at this point. Not at this point, at this point. Let's give it a name. Call it point A. Let's call this point B. So at point A, you will feel a downward tug. However, because of these, these two strings, you would feel two upward tugs. Let's call this tension 1. Let's call this tension 2. Let's call this tension T. Now, because this is a massless string, if the tension is T here, it's got to be T here, which means that the equation below would be T upward minus mg, and it's, since it's in equilibrium, it's going to be zero. This is what happens at B. Let us do the corresponding free body diagram here. Let's say this angle is 45 and that angle is 60. What I need to do, and this is very important, it's also superbly simple. I need to recognize that I can think in terms of horizontal and vertical axes. So T2 here with the angle theta here, that means this is also 60, which means this is going to be T2 cos 60, this piece of T2. And likewise, this is going to be T1 cos 45. So these two forces must balance out, which means T2 cos 60 minus T1 cos 45 must be zero because there has to be 
equilibrium along the horizontal direction, which means in the vertical direction, I should have T1 sine 60 minus, sorry, plus T2 sine 45. Those are vertical pieces here. Okay, these are vertical. Minus T. That must be equal to zero. So this would be the equation for what's going on at A. So I've set up for the first time the equilibrium equations for this problem for you. It's a very typical problem. Actually, the problem that I gave you guys in the homework in which you had a, a whole a, two different vectors with one pointing down, that was basically this problem. I, I was actually having you do this problem ahead of time. I didn't, I didn't give them name of forces or anything. I just said they're vectors, but that's what you were doing. So let me quit here now and go to the quiz, and then we will start to do some really, really tough problems next week.